Hi, my name is Sharon Chen and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I would discuss inflammatory diarrhea caused by bacteria, focusing on two specific bacteria. Here's our course framework. I will show you how these two bacteria colonize and persist and how they interact with the host immune system, causing strong local inflammation, all of which then lead to the clinical presentation. The learning objectives are to describe the clinical findings, epidemiology, and pathogenesis of dysentery due to Shigatoxigenic E. coli and Shigella. Here is the overview framework of inflammatory diarrhea. Inflammatory diarrhea is really an ileocolitis because the infection is in the terminal ileum and colon. Inflammatory diarrhea is as the name suggests. There's a lot of inflammation, so you may see blood and even pus. You may hear doctors refer to this type of diarrhea as bloody diarrhea. Thus, the pathogenesis involves more invasion and more damage to enterocytes compared to the pathogenesis of watery diarrhea. In this discussion, I will first tell you about another E. coli similar to enteropathogenic E. coli, EPEC, which you heard about in another video. But this E. coli has acquired additional virulence factors to cause more damage to the enterocyte and more inflammation. This E. coli has many names. Shigatoxigenic E. coli is the current preferred name, STEC for short. But you might hear this referred to as enterohemorrhagic E. coli or EHEC. We will also discuss Shigella, which takes the infection a step further because this bacteria invades the cell. What is Shigatoxigenic E. coli? It's an animal form of enteropathogenic E. coli that acquired a toxin gene called Shigatoxin. Enteropathogenic E. coli, or EPEC, and I'll use the term EPEC from now on, got this gene through a virus infection. A bacteriophage, that's a virus that infects bacteria, infected EPEC, and via the infection, EPEC received the gene that can produce Shigatoxin. Like EPEC, Shigatoxigenic E. coli already has a type 3 secretion system, and now it has the ability to produce Shigatoxin. There are many strains of STEC, and they are classified by antibody assays. The most common strain in the U.S. is called O157H7. The O antigen is part of LPS, and the H antigen is part of flagellin. There are other strains. All the strains of STEC cause bloody diarrhea, and in 5 to 10% of cases, it can cause a more serious disease called hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. I will talk about this more later. What happens to people infected with STEC? After ingesting contaminated food, you won't have symptoms for about 2 to 5 days during the incubation period. Then, watery diarrhea will develop followed by bloody diarrhea. And in the top picture, you can see the uh, blood in the colon. People can have abdominal pain, but typically no fever. For most people, the symptoms will subside in a week. But in 5 to 10% of cases, hemolytic uremic syndrome will develop about a week later. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, is characterized by hemolysis of red blood cells that lead to anemia and low platelets, or thrombocytopenia. The anemia is called microangiopathic because the cells are being sheared and fragmented in small vessels, partially occluded with tiny clots. You can see the fragmented red blood cells in this image. They are called schistocytes. These tiny clots can occur in any vessel in the body, but most commonly the clots occur in kidney vessels, which can then lead to acute renal failure. You can see these clots in the glomeruli in this image. The arrows are pointing to it. Some people can also have tiny clots in the central nervous system. Because of the kidney problems, more than half of the patients will require dialysis. This is a process where a machine functions as an artificial kidney when the real kidney isn't working. This is a serious disease. Even in the United States, HUS carries a 5 to 10 percent mortality. So how does STEC cause disease? The first step is to attach, and it does this in exactly the same way as EPEC but then it has the ability to secrete shigatoxin. Shigatoxin is an AB toxin. It's in the same class as cholera toxin, which I talked about in a previous video, so this should sound familiar. The B subunit binds to GB3. This is a sugar-decorated lipid that is on the surface of many types of cells. Because of binding, the B subunit gives shigatoxin specificity. The A subunit translocates into the cytosol. A subunit is an enzyme, and it inactivates ribosomes and shuts down protein synthesis in the cell. With protein shutdown, the cell triggers apoptosis, the cell dies. In addition, the cell senses intoxication and makes a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Shigatoxin can also cause platelets to aggregate and clot, causing microthrombi and local ischemia. 
cell apoptosis, strong inflammatory responses, and local tissue ischemia all contribute to the patient experiencing bloody diarrhea. If shigatoxin gets absorbed beyond the epithelium, it can be systemically distributed to other parts of the body. The same microthrombi and local ischemia can then be seen in other organs, like the kidney or the brain. The systemic distribution of shigatoxin and its effects on various cells, including endothelial cells, leads to the signs and symptoms of hemolytic uremic syndrome. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way of treating this infection because most of the damage has been done before we are able to care for the patient. Treatment is supportive until the effects of the toxin wear off. Kidney failure is supported by dialysis, and red blood cells and platelets are given. There are some new ideas to target sugar toxin because this is such a serious disease. Some examples include vaccines, monoclonal antibodies, or even receptor mimics to block toxin uptake. But timing is an issue. As I said before, much of the damage is done by the time the person is symptomatic. In addition, some studies suggest that giving antibiotics can make things worse. Why? Bacteria don't produce a lot of toxin unless they are stressed, for example, when bacteria are starved of iron or when they encounter antibiotics. So the answer of how antibiotics might be harmful is linked to the evolution of the toxin genes. Remember that the toxin genes for shigatoxin came from a bacteriophage. When we give antibiotics, it triggers an SOS response to the bacteriophage inside the bacteria that it's time to get out. Something bad is happening to the bacteria. So the bacteriophage produces more of itself, and because the toxin genes are part of the bacteriophage genome, the bacteriophage produces shigatoxin at the same time. So this is one inflammatory diarrhea where you don't want to give empiric antibiotics. Antibiotics may not be helpful and may be harmful for this infection by inducing more shigatoxin production. In some studies, antibiotic treatment may also increase the rate of HUS. Our main way of fighting this infection is preventing the infection in the first place. If you want to prevent this infection, you need to know how people get this infection. So how do we get STEC? The source of STEC is contaminated food. I mentioned before that STEC is an EPEC from animals, so it's a zoonotic disease. It's not spread human to human. And it turns out that STEC is a commensal in cows. It doesn't cause disease in them. STEC has become more prevalent in the United States because our meat industry has grown. In fact, STEC infections used to be called the hamburger disease because most cases came from undercooked meat, typically ground beef. Now, many of the outbreaks are from contaminated leafy greens. So how do they get contaminated? It's from water runoff contaminated by animal manure. And there is a lot of animal manure. In the U.S., over one ton of animal manure is produced per person per year. This is 40 times the amount of human waste. Without proper use, it is not hard to imagine that some of this animal manure might get onto the food growing in the fields. New outbreaks are still occurring. The worst was in 2011 in Germany. STEC infection affected more than 4,000 people in several countries. They had bloody diarrhea, and very worrisome was a higher than usual percentage of people who got HUS, 25% instead of just 5 to 10%. The cause of this outbreak was an STEC, but it was different from previous ones. This one was an enteroaggregative E. coli, not the usual EPEC, that acquired shigatoxin from horizontal gene transfer. The food source of the outbreak was ironically a health food, fenugreek sprouts imported from Egypt. Now we're going to discuss Shigella. This bacteria is the classic example of inflammatory diarrhea. You'll also hear doctors refer to this bloody diarrhea as dysentery. Shigella is very closely related to E. coli, so close that if we discovered it today, it would have been called an E. coli. It's an E. coli that acquired a plasmid with virulence genes that allow it to invade epithelial cells and macrophages and repli replicate inside the cell. This is what I mean when I said that Shigella has taken intestinal infection one step further. Infection from the other bacteria occurred on the surface of the cell. Shigella invades it. Some Shigella also produce shigatoxin. In contrast to STEC, Shigella are human-specific bacteria. They can only infect humans and primates, so transmission is human-to-human -human via fecal-oral route. It is very infectious. It only takes 10 to 100 bacteria to cause disease, and it can resist stomach acid. This is probably why it's more prevalent in the developing world, although we can see it in the U.S. There is a saying, food, feces, fingers, and flies, to remember that very little Shigella is needed for transmission. 
Even a tiny little fly contaminated with a bit of Shigella can transmit this infection. You can see from the drawing that Shigella looks a little naked compared to E. coli drawings. That's because it doesn't have flagella like E. coli. Flagella is a powerful trigger for an innate immune response, and Shigella would like to avoid activating an immune response inside the cell. The clinical presentation of Shigella is a bit different than STEC. After ingesting Shigella, no symptoms occur for about one to seven days, but then fever appears with abdominal pain and cramping, Water, watery diarrhea starts first, then it becomes bloody and mucousy from dying cells and neutrophils. You can have 50 to 100 stools a day with a sense of urgency and pain on defecation. This is called tenesmus. Here's a picture of stool from an infected person, and you can see lots of cell cellular debris from dying cells and inflammatory cells like the neutrophils pictured. This infection should be treated with antibiotics, unlike STEC. But it's important that you make the diagnosis of Shigella first. Testing is simple, get a stool culture. So how does Shigella cause diarrhea? Shigella actively invades cells. They invade through M cells, which are part of the Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are lymphoid tissue and are part of the mucosal immune system of the intestinal tract. This image is of mouse intestine with its Peyer's patches lit up. Shigella finds these special M cells. So here's a picture of what they look like zoomed in. And using their type 3 secretion needle, they inject infectors into the cell that induce the host cell to take it up. So here's an image of Shigella entering an M cell. Inside the cell, Shigella can escape into the cytosol and uses actin to move around. And in this image, Shigella is green with a red tail of actin acting like a rocket. It can then spread from cell to cell. Now, I'm going to show you a video made by a Japanese investigator that shows you all the steps that occur resulting in bloody diarrhea. After ingestion, Shigella travels all the way down to the terminal ileum and colon. And when they reach an M cell in the Peyer's patches, this is in blue, the M cell takes up Shigella and transfers it to the macrophages where they are not killed but escape the phagosome and replicate intracellularly. Replication triggers the macrophage to apoptose, releasing Shigella and the cytokines to the underside of the epithelium. Shigella uses its type 3 secretion system to induce its uptake. And when inside the enterocyte, you can see that they are in a vacuole, but they can lyse this vacuole and are now free in the cytosol, where they move by using actin. And they can also replicate in here. Movement in the cytosol allows them to push themselves into neighboring cells without having to come out. Via innate immune mechanisms, the enterocytes now detect that they are infected and produce cytokines that bring in inflammatory cells. The infection is rapidly spreading through the epithelium and inflammation is mounting at this point. These inflammatory cells eventually extravasate through the epithelium, which forms mucus. And on a macro level, when infection is widespread enough, we begin to see epithelial cells dying and blood and mucus in the stool.